This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is a noon hour on Thursday again, folks. Ted Ralston here in our downtown Honolulu studio, welcoming Ray Sushiyama on for the first time you've been on this show, I think, Ray, but no. you're not a stranger to Think Tech. No, I've been on this show oh, twice. Oh, you have? Yes, then that's I'm, right. I, If I wasn't so old, I'd remember that that's better, right. right? Anyway, Ray, yeah. thanks for coming on again <laughs> at, this, uh, at this, this hour. New ch I know what it is. It's a new hour. It, the uh, time right. before was that's Fridays right. at 4 o'clock, and now we've done, moved it to Thursday at right. noon. So, and, of course, the world of our... Of our uh, Trusted listeners out there sets their clocks by this show, so it is noon hour on Thursday. You can set your clocks and adjust your calendars as appropriate. Anyway, I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, thank uh, Mike Elliott for coming on this show two weeks ago, hosting it. I was uh, with Margie in a conference in San Diego on unmanned air systems, UAS, and then we had another one, a uh, complimentary uh, conference on the same subject up in uh, Santa Fe. Um, last week, so we have uh, had a vacant slot last week in the show, back on live, and should be hitting it hard for the rest of the Thursdays of the year, which there's about two left. Anyway, uh, what was, we talk about drones on the show a lot, but there's nothing, there's no drone on the table, there's, a, there's someone who drones on here on the table, but there's not a drone on the table, because we're going to talk about the virtual aspects of drones, things we can't necessarily see, it's how they fit in the economy and the growth of our economy here. That's why we have Ray Suchiyama online, and we have Dr. Peter Quigley sitting online also by Skype. Often we use Skype to get to this show to Alaska or to East Coast or something like that. Today we're getting this show from Honolulu all the way to Manoa by, by Skype and by cell phone. So, Peter, welcome aboard again. There you are. Great. Okay. Great to be here. Yeah, and Peter's been on the show as well. Uh, Peter, of course, is the uh, Associate uh, Vice President for the Community Colleges in the University System. So I have two guys here in the show uh, who've been thinking a lot about the role of education and the future of our economy and how technology and STEM fit in that economy. And uh, I just think that drones are a really interesting example of that. And people that we deal with shouldn't, and our, our viewers shouldn't think of drones forever going to be just like they are today. One guy and a controller and a drone to get out of a box and go fly it somewhere. There's the whole world of drones is, is changing and changing rapidly. As command and control schemes change, the mathematics of complex systems comes into the picture, and the value measured at the customer end begins, begins, begins to drive what's going to happen here. So we're seeing, we have a, a whole career and future here in drones, and we could do a lot of that right here in Hawaii. So I, I, I was kind of reacting a couple of weeks ago to some information about uh, enrollment and such, and went back to the op-ed that I had read in the paper that you wrote, Ray, about maybe six weeks ago. No, it's uh, way back. Oh, I mean, which one? Are this is one about? about the your experience at Google right, and right, the right. bringing a technology theme right. into our economy here right. as a salvation for it. So I thought of that, and I thought of what uh, Dr. quigley has been doing in terms of um, looking at other areas like San Diego, for example, that have come up from a a tourist or military base to a more uh, high-tech base and, and how that all occurred because likely we have to deal with that, that situation. So I wanted you to speak first on the, the, the themes that you had in your op-ed a couple of weeks ago and, and what ideas you had about how we might take that forward and think of drones as a carrier of that uh, vector and then talk to Peter about what he's, what he's seeing taking place in San Diego, how that worked and how that might be a model that we could tie together here. It's a few weeks ago, I did publish an op-ed of a Star Advertiser, and it was on lessons for Hawaii from Google, from my experiences as a senior consultant at Google in Tokyo and Mountain View. And I talked about how Google is a meritocracy, it's based on research, uh, it's uh, focused on uh, products, uh, on, on design uh, products, and really uh, of a global marketplace. And I, I touched upon all those things uh, in my article. However, having said that, about two years ago, in the fall, September of 2015, I published two op-eds in Civil Beat, actually. And it focused on uh, drones, the UAS or drones, uh, being, uh, being the foundation for economic development in Alaska, in the state, and also in Oregon and several other states in, in, on the mainland, and how the drone becomes a centerpiece for uh, K-12 teaching of math and science and engineering for uh, use in uh, as, as startups, for manufacturing, for 
all kinds of things dealing with agriculture. And, and so it becomes a, a kind of a focal point for a whole new diversification of the economy. And Alaska was leading the way, uh, according to my uh, op-eds of, of, of that period uh, two years ago. And I had a whole strategy for Hawaii to go forth and do a similar thing using the drone and, and, uh, and then using that as a topic of research at UH, at community colleges, uh, and startups, Bishop Street, uh, you know, agriculture and so forth. So it, 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 the Google article is one thing, but I did focus uh, directly on drones as, as a centerpiece for economic diversification for the state. So, so interpreting all that, there's a, a strong value here in STEM it itself and uh, drones as an instigator of STEM interest and value is measured at the agricultural, environmental or law enforcement level and quality of life ultimately at, at the end of the day in Hawaii. And to some extent, Peter, that's what you have uh, observed taking place in San Diego in terms of the quality of life in San Diego having been approved by this transition from a tourist and a military based uh, economy to something that's more, much more diverse and has a lot of high tech and, and uh, medicines and such like that in it. So how do we take what Ray observed and what you've observed and think about them in parallel that can be used to enhance operations and economy here in Hawaii? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, the San Diego example is, as you point out, very compelling for us because, you know, the 30 years ago they looked around and saw they had real estate, they had a naval base, and they had a tourist economy. And the fathers and mothers of that uh, area were worried about how narrow that is. And we've got plenty of people on record in Hawaii talking about the narrow profile of our economic uh, offerings. We're in those same three areas primarily as well. And as Howard Dykus frequently points out, and as economists frequently point out, uh, it's terribly cyclical to be tied to something like a tourist economy because, first of all, it can be disrupted and changed so easily. And, and, uh, and of course, you know, in the tourism economy, which we love, of course, you know, we love being a point of destination and, and that economy. I'm not suggesting that we don't have that economy. I'm just suggesting by itself it puts us on a pretty dangerous footing. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the jobs in the tourism sector require no college degree. Half of those don't require a high school degree, which is a great sort of entry access for a lot of folks. But in terms of a place uh, where we're living here, where, you know, the average cost of housing, you know, starts 500000 on the low end, uh, and if you're trying to pay for uh, – my salary in the state or the government salary uh, and retirement uh, based on $15 an hour jobs and tourism, you can see where you get perhaps an unfunded liability building up because you're not paying your bills. So San Diego took the bull by the horns and, um, and they had some long-term thought leaders uh, in that area get together and they go, this place has just simply got to be more. And that conversation had been going on in San Diego for a long time like it has here. You know, that, that we seem to be sitting on so much potential, like the drone opportunity, like cybersecurity, and, and what's keeping us from uh, really exploiting that and making that go further. Um, so it, it becomes not so much the, the technical opportunity as it does... Uh, become the the culture. You you know we simply have to figure out how to develop a culture of shared risk taking, uh, a culture of impatience about where we are now. And uh, San Diego moved, as I mentioned to you before, in in a span of in a span of uh, 30 years, from a three billion dollar regional economy to a 182 billion dollar regional economy. And they added two sectors. They added biotech and they added telecommunications. Um, so uh, uh, drones and the associated technology, uh, and, and Ray already mentioned some of the agricultural applications, security applications, creative media. Right now in the triple count up the North Shore, they are doing some of the most marvelous photography at Pipeline. Uh, that you can possibly imagine shots of surfers at pipeline nobody's ever seen before. You know, right, you know, flying alongside the surfer, on top of the wave, behind the wave, and certainly with our our creative arts media, you can see the applications here. So it's not simply we, the opportunity is sitting in front of us, like San Diego had these opportunities for a number of years, but until the three, what I call the three stools of the engine, 
of innovation come together, and that's the government, the university system, and the private sector on a collective agreement to take some uh, shared risks and to put some benchmarks out and say, we're going to grow this place in some new uh, ways. And the drone uh, is a disruptive technology, as you know, um, and we need something to disrupt the status quo in our economy and bring some excitement. And as Ray was pointing out, this reaches right into the classroom, reaches young people, as well as professionals in real estate and other folks in the market. So it's got some real potential, but uh, we need we need folks to see the urgency of our uh, sort of current uh, narrow economic profile and uh, see this as an opportunity for us to develop and have startups and businesses, et cetera. One of the things that um, people might uh, look at that we need, regardless of whatever level of uh, the economy we have here is we, the government costs a certain amount to run. We've got uh, the roads, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the, uh, the, our, our legislative system, we've got our city councils and all. There's a certain fixed cost that we need, that need to bear, regardless of whatever we do. The one factor alone is just the cost of government, and the cost of government in the future being paid by a progressively less uh, wealthy uh, economic status is itself threatening, is it not? Well, I guess that's my point too. You know, I, uh, um, it, you know, it, uh, just on paying the bills, you have to say, you know, you, there's a couple of ways you can look at your budget. You know, from a state level or a household but, uh, level, you can either cut expenses or you can raise revenue or you can do both, right? Um, if you imagine bringing on STEM sector opportunities like the one we're talking about with drones or cyber or some of the other areas that are being talked about today. And you create new jobs there, you're creating new wealth, and you're creating new tax revenues. Uh, we tend to go back to the same well and say, well, we're going to tax real estate or something of that nature, and, uh, uh, and, and you can only take that so far. That's, that's the uh, going back to the same well over and over again. New uh, wealth is, is, is created by bringing in new companies, new jobs, new sectors. Now, you, these don't come out of thin air. Usually with San Diego, those sectors have been around for a while, slumbering, um, and it takes this kind of courage of those three legs of the stool I told you about. You know, San Diego went out and uh, and uh, you know the mayor went out and and, and did some uh, uh, recruiting of companies, uh, did some land policy uh, renewal, did some uh, incentives. The university started bringing in the research dollars to sort of match the the uh, economic strategy of the mayor, and then the private sector put together a, a group called San Diego Connect that that helped understand the the cluster behavior in the area, so they could all sort of mar uh, mark and and assess how the growth was going. But the point was, they all wanted these were people that were not in it for themselves or for their own businesses. But they love the region so much that in 20, 30, 40 years from when they started, they wanted San Diego to be this incredibly rich uh, area, both in culture and intellectual richness as well as economic richness. And it's pretty easy to see that they've made that, uh, they've accomplished that goal. And uh, you, you throw your hand out, San Diego, or you're going to meet a smart person that's got a startup going. That's, that's quite an incredible picture you've painted here, Peter, and kind of a model for us to think about. So in your experience with Google and such, uh, Ray, how do, how do you see the, the, the elements that, are, that we could do here in Hawaii, which don't mean heavy-duty production and manufacturing, but has to do with intellectual uh, development and such, and software and small elements that can be easily transported and shipped and don't depend on a supply line of raw materials. How do you see the Google model following what, acting as a channel that would allow Peter's idea to go forward. Well, uh, what Peter said is, um, is a vision for the future of Hawaii. But if you, if you put uh, names and companies to uh, the San Diego uh, growth um, history, uh, we have uh, universities like San Diego State, UC San Diego, Scripps Institute, uh, those, those were really um, a key to um, uh, research and uh, entrepreneurship and so forth. So uh, they have great centers of excellence in cybersecurity, for example, at San Diego State. 
and Asia Pacific Studies at, uh, at UC uh, San Diego. And plus, uh, there were a migration of people. Uh, interesting, I used to work for MIT, um, and uh, Erwin Jacobs and Andy Verturbi were two um, uh, founders of Qualcomm. And that was a major uh, center, uh, uh, and, and that brought in uh, more startups in the mobile space. Kyocera came, Nokia came, and of course, biotech followed that later on. So there is a kind of a, a, a symbiotic relationship between the university, research, uh, entrepreneurship, and the, the city of San Diego that saw that uh, military and tourism were not going to be um, uh, growing that much in the future. They needed another growth area, which was high tech. And they also, there was another part of this that uh, we have to see, which is the Maki Laura, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the duty-free uh, tax-free uh, zones on the Mexican border that added to Sony's and all kinds of Japanese companies coming. And in fact, there's a Japan Society of San Diego and Tijuana. <laughs> there are uh, Japanese companies that came in and made uh, headquarters and, and uh, uh, people who went south to work on these, uh, on these plants and shipping you know, duty-free uh, TVs and phones and PCs into the U.S. So th those are a lot, lot of uh, converging uh, um, factors that really uh, uh, assisted um, uh, San Diego to blossom the last few years. But again, what Peter pointed out uh, very well is that there was a um, synergy uh, among business and uh, universities and, and um, of course, um, uh, the uh, uh, kind of a, a, a community leadership that really brought this to fruition. Okay, so there's a couple different factors here in what you've added to the conversation. And uh, in one of them is that uh, a labor pool available. Uh, obviously raw materials and transportation and such to get materials in. And let's take our first break here, our only break, and come back and talk about how we might outline a path forward for Hawaii based on the experience you've got at Google and what Peter outlined at, uh, that uh, San Diego has done. We'll come back in one minute. Aloha kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. We are back, folks, in the second half of our show, Where the Drone Leads, on Think Tech Hawaii, Thursday noon hour, which, of course, uh, people around the world set their clocks uh, by that and uh, recognize, of course, that uh, daylight savings has gone away, so think of standard time. <laughs> anyway, in, in the studio here, we have Ray Suchiama. Oh, thank you again. Ray, yeah. and uh, we have uh, Dr. Time. Peter Quigley standing by well across the city of Honolulu in Manoa, up in the valley. And we just had a really interesting discussion here in the first part of our show about uh, the model of San, that San Diego has laid before us, that uh, whether they like it or not, and of course the models that you've experienced in terms of technology uh, component ending to a economic growth. And we're talking about how Hawaii might grasp that, that or turn that into a picture useful for Hawaii. We don't have uh, a source of inexpensive labor like uh, San Diego does. We don't have the shipment aspect of easy transport of materials. We don't have any raw materials. So our raw material here is intellectual property, and uh, the, the fact that it's an attractive climate to come to work in. Our product would have to be something that isn't like a, a rocket. It isn't like a heavy airplane. It isn't like heavy machinery. It's something more in the software, in the, in the uh, intellectual domain. And so uh, what we've outlined is that uh, we've got to have the university involved in this future. We've got to have business involved in the future. But there has to be something that we can produce and sell. If we don't, can't produce and sell it, regardless of how good we are, it, it doesn't become part of the economy. So uh, uh, what do you think, Peter, about what kind of a outline we can create or 
picture we can put on the paper or something like that, that that deviates from what San Diego did because of the reasons that we can't copy them necessarily, but embraces what Ray's been talking about and yeah. a few folks we can get a hold well, of to take it forward. Well, you mentioned uh, what we don't have. What we do have is a 10-campus university system with a flagship research institution in the center of it, which is usually one of the primary variables for an innovation economy anywhere you look in the United States. We do have a med school, for God's sakes, and a cancer research center, and we have an astronomy <coughs> science um, in the state and other science and technology investments that are pretty, pretty, pretty formidable, you know. So, and we do have a metropolitan district. We have a banking industry. Uh, we're a great point of destination. As I said before, tourism um, is a great uh, sector to have, and you can certainly modify tourism by adding medical tourism and uh, environmental tourism, and all those things are in front of us, too. But as you point out, <clears throat> it would help to have a plan, you know, and uh, we've started in in coordination with the Chamber of Commerce, a series of sector convenings where we're meeting with the CEOs of the banking, healthcare, uh, tourism industries, and we're going to meet with energy um, and creative arts to talk about, you know, how do we how do we enhance their sectors? What is it that we can do as a university system as well as a community of, of concerned folks to make those industries more powerful than they are today, more, you know, deepen uh, you know their their place here and the and the layered sophistication of those interests. So we have a process now that has started uh, and some work groups that have have occurred. So we've got the I think the fragile beginnings of what you would call what San Diego Connect did, bringing everybody around the table to say how do we benchmark our way forward uh, from our current economic profile to something. Uh, you know, more complex and rich and deep uh, in the next uh, couple of decades. That's a real possibility, uh, and it's and it's. Uh, you've got a lot of folks at uh, Hawaii Business Roundtable that have been working this issue. You know, Rich Wacker has been a real help, the president of American Savings, and, and a thought leader in helping us uh, figure out how to. And, and Terry George at Castle. So you've got some of the real important variables. You got the people that count are in this conversation. We've got a nascent structure of a, a way to do business in Hawaii that could focus on how do we take drones and make this into a research slash startup slash business job creating industry. I'll tell you, I was uh, on a panel of 10, 15 folks this summer in China talking about the future of the entrepreneurial university and uh, to a country, uh, Malaysia, China, J Japan, uh, India, they are going full bore in this area. They see the university system as a crucial part of their national security. They're going STEM uh, like you wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, one, one university says, we are not graduating job seekers. We're graduating job creators. And I thought, oh, my goodness. You know, they get it. They're on it. We need to make sure we're there, too. Okay. And actually, the drone issue uh, could contribute to this to the consolidation of thinking you're speaking of, we are just, the state of Hawaii is, is uh, through DBED, is putting in a proposal to an FAA uh, solicitation for a way that the local community, including its governance, uh, non the, not the federal side, but the state, local, tribal, and community organizations could find a way that drones become most useful in their particular environment uh, in under 200 feet, under 400 feet, uh, is the first step in having the the local organizations, the local governance, manage airspace in its own domain. And they're not going to quite get there in this pilot program, but the idea of bringing together the community, all elements of it, so that the whole solution is present, and it isn't just a technical solution or just a, just a, a product solution, but there's a solution that includes STEM, includes uh, education, includes the community participation and such. So. We have a we have a uh, we have a, a real need, Peter. We could toss in the middle of this activity you're speaking of, where all the members that you've got in that community of, of business leaders would probably have a really important opinion here. And uh, we have to submit this proposal uh, on the fourth of January. We've already submitted two of the six volumes that are in the proposal. So if there's some way we can get this story out in a condensed form to that roundtable, I'd like very much to do that and uh, give, a, give a copy to both of you guys. But this is, this is kind of like, this is actually a presidential directive. It's part of the drain the swamp thing. Put, 
put, get the federal government out of local business and local governance and have the local agencies figure out how to collaborate, work together, and drive the future in their own domain. So I think it's a, it's a modest but a, an example of what would be the kind of collaboration that you're seeking. And in, coming out of that would be the engineering associated with drone usage, the uh, software that comes up with the analysis of farm crop analysis and such. So there's a, a way we can tie these together, I think. Yeah, well, I mentioned Alaska early on, yeah. and they, in 2015, more than two years ago, they published a uh, comprehensive uh, report called Unmanned Aircraft Systems and Economic Development Strategy for Alaska. And that uh, uh, triggered, of course, uh, you've been there, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks campus, they, they have a UAS center there. They call it UCASI. Or That's right. right. Are you, are, did you have a copy of that, that uh, report? I, I can send it to you, yeah, right. and, okay. and, and to Peter. Yep. And it's a, it's a very interesting document because they point out advantages about how big, uh, how big Alaska is, of course, the focus on uh, Native Alaskan uh, children, K-12, uh, STEM education, and of course, uh, you know, becoming a center for, uh, as Peter said, and I'm, uh, we, we have to focus on it, for business. You know, how do you design drones? How do you make apps? How do you make them? You know, you don't have to make them there. You can make them somewhere else in China. DJI, uh, you know, is now a billion dollar company. <laughs> That's all they do. And everybody is getting a drone for Christmas. Uh, so uh, it's it's a big, uh, big, you know, and the thing is, when you look at robotics, and robotics is a great multidisciplinary field, but there are no personal robotics companies. They don't make money. <laughs> we have DJI that's make, and many others that make making money. Okay, and so the making money is the end, of, end state of this. That's what the, generates the uh, growth in the economy, and that's what pays the bills for the government and such. So let me do that, Peter. Let me get you uh, the synopsis of this uh, proposal that is due on the 4th, and uh, we'll figure out how to deposit it in the roundtable, get feedback, at least get them to be aware of it. And then we have between then and May to get all of our coordination in place and the themes struck out and such, and then we get notified in May of whether we're going to proceed or not. So let me let me go ahead and do that. And if you'll get the Alaska report, right. that'll be great. And then we'll uh, all get together on this show again sometime. And anyway, for today, uh, Ray, thanks for coming on to the show Thank and you again. bringing our okay. your usual incredible <laughs> insight. I wish we could execute your insight really quickly. And Peter, uh, the leadership you got in, in in thought leadership here in terms of pushing forward and identifying barriers and identifying pathways that might work is uh, really uh, enlightening and, uh, and very thoughtful and appreciate that very much. So thank you two guys for coming on and we'll see you all next Thursday.